Ladies and gentlemen, coming soon, a podcast you've all been waiting for. The Movie Podcast to End All Movie Podcasts, a podcast that discusses and critiques the best of the best and the worst of the worst movies playing at a theater near you with a host whose opinions have been deemed as fact by your favorite fact checkers. And that's a fact. Without further ado, let me introduce you to the movie maestro, the tyrant of theater, the gumshoe of review, the man that makes theater employees and Hollywood execs shiver by his mere presence. Ladies and gentlemen, the judge, the jury, the sultan of cinema, Justin Hanson. Welcome to the Movie Wire. Welcome to this week's edition of the Movie Wire. I'm your host, Justin Henson, and welcome to the show. We have a fantastic show this week with four brand new reviews, with two new in theaters, and two now available to stream, including an early review and also a special announcement this week on the show. John Cena plays an ex-special force agent hired to protect a journalist set to interview a dictator in the early review of Freelance. Tommy Lee Jones and Jamie Foxx try to take down a multi-billion dollar company in the Amazon original, The Burial. Experience your inner demons in the Hulu original, Appendage. And finally, you know, I know I've been asked numerous times in the last week if I was going to review the new Taylor Swift concert movie, more specifically from Josh and Alex over at the Talking Smack podcast. And I've repeated my answer over and over again that the answer is gonna be no. Not a chance. But I do have a big surprise for Josh and Alex over the talking spat. This week on the show, I actually will be reviewing... Peter Dinklage in a romantic comedy about a composer who suffers writer's block. And then he has a one-night stand. In the new film, She Came to Me. Sorry to disappoint Josh and Alex. We have a big show to cover, so let's jump right into it. Ready for my verdict? Let's get into it. <laughs> Out of the windows to watch a roar and a burst of flame. The Movie Wire Podcast. There it is. We've just you need people like me. The Wire. And here we go. Inspired by true events, a lawyer helps a funeral homeowner save his family business from a corporate behemoth, exposing a complex web of race, power, and injustice in the Amazon original, The Burial. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, how y'all doing? All y'all that don't know who I am, my name is Willie Gary. Willie Gary. Willie Gary. William Gary. Never heard of him. What's so special about this guy, anyway? Litigation is war. It's a battle. Bam! And I'm not talking about no bullshit either. I'm talking about some John Card Van Damme ass-kicking shit. Truth is, I may have gotten myself into a lot of trouble. I've been your lawyer 30 years. We can find a way out of it. You've never sued anybody before in your whole life. This fella tried to bully me out of business, and I don't think I should be expected to stand for it. Mr. Gary hasn't lost a case in over 12 years. You suggesting I hire this guy as one of my lawyers? Y'all come on in. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Gary. Let me introduce you to my call, Red. How do you feel about working with black folk? I suppose I am a little prejudiced. Mm. Did you meet my team? I'm Chris. Deshaun. Reggie Douglas. Gentlemen. He's suing us? He's suing us? We are a half a billion dollar corporation. So how much money y'all trying to get? Eight million. That ain't enough money. One hundred million dollars. <laughs> Who is this clown he's hired as a lawyer? Go fight a man. What made you want to do it? Because he tried to mess with the one thing that means the most to me in life, being able to leave something behind for my grandchildren. Let's play some music. My name is Mame Downs. Graduated top of her class from Harvard Law School. Uh-huh. They had a nickname for her around the office. The Python. I wouldn't get too used to me being kind to you, Mr. Gary. Once we begin that trial, I'm gonna destroy you. Well, can't you see that we're golden? We don't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning this case. Just, just trust me, okay? I, I, I may have found something. What does it feel like to be some small-time nobody on the verge of bankruptcy? What if I don't win and 
I let all these people down. You have been trying to turn this into your own one ring circus. I got my damn life on the line. I know that, Jerry. Did it ever bother you? Oh, the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy. You sit your ass down. I'm Jerry, your honor. Hey, hey, wait, wait. What's the matter? can't split the pole. Can't split the pole. Now, come on, Doc. Now, not many know the story of small-town business owner Jeremiah O'Keefe, nor his story. Not many know the story of this trial. I sure didn't have a clue about this trial, nor did I feel the need to research the trial before viewing this film. And I will also encourage viewers not to research this trial before viewing this movie. And open and honest, reading the synopsis about a funeral homeowner that takes on a corporate behemoth didn't really feel that interesting to me. But it did pique my interest with a fantastic team-up of Jamie Foxx, who plays Willie Gary, who is hired by Jeremiah O'Keefe, played by Tommy Lee Jones. And even though reading the synopsis may have given me a preempted yawn, and it actually might discourage people from viewing this film because it doesn't sound that interesting. But let me just say, after numerous weeks, months of just mere cinematic drivel, it took a movie based on a true story about a funeral homeowner for me to stand on my feet and say, We got one! Finally, finally, a film that I can hand over heart say, see this movie. We have a film here that is not only incredibly engaging, but infectious. That during the climax, I was on my feet expecting the worst and hoping the best when it comes to the outcome of our character of Jeremiah O'Keefe. Even as an impulse, I couldn't help it, but I had to shout at the screen. But I should just give a reminder that this movie is only on streaming. I was shouting in the comfort of my own home. But this is a movie that I wish would have hit theaters because I have a feeling this movie would have been extremely fun just to sit back and watch everybody in the theater's body language. The movie takes us through emotions of anger, happiness, stress. My eyes were glued on the screen. The burial takes us through all the feelings of emotion of a courtroom film. With the only difference of it being a refreshing take where it doesn't just follow the courtroom drama formula that we have seen before, like 12 Angry Men, A Few Good Men, Autonomy of Murder, but rather it adds a lighter tone that we kind of see between courtroom drama and My Cousin Vinny. It adds a true human element to it that it truly feels like it knows how to work the room like an actual lawyer. It truly treats the viewer as we are part of the case. The film is brilliantly written by Doug Wright, Jonathan Haar, and our director, Maggie Betts, who all have very little projects to their name, except for Jonathan Haar, who did 1998's A Civil Action, starring John Travolta, and Doug Wright, who did Quills from the year 2000. Now, before I keep complimenting this film, the burial does have its flaws, and director Maggie Betts does seem to bounce around quite a bit when it comes to moments of substance in the characters. But at the same time, I can't blame her for this for what she's trying to accomplish when it comes to the material. She knows exactly what movie she wanted to help write and what movie she wanted to make. She wanted to inspire bravery, greed, but also include the topics of poor communities, racism, corruption. But this is where the writing and the direction is actually quite brilliant, is that she addresses all these topics, but she never makes these topics a main focal point. She wants to stick to the written material. She wants to stick to the case. She wants to include all these themes, but she doesn't lose track of the vision. Maggie Betts treats this movie as it's an actual court case. The style of shooting at times can feel brief and short, but this is what gives the inclusion piece of us making it feel like we're actually in the courtroom. And this is what I loved about the strategy of the burial, is that it keeps us with the feeling of nobody is guilty until proven guilty. It's almost like we're a member of the jury and the film is trying to sell us on who we should be rooting for. We don't know our company's true intent throughout the film. We are solely based with our cast character traits that we see throughout the movie. Betts doesn't give us any hard evidence up close. We don't see the point of view of our corrupt company. We just let the movie take us on the ride of the journey. And we don't see the point of view of the company throughout the film because that's not the vision of the story. And of course, we're naturally going to side with the financially struggling old man. And we are waiting for the defense to convince us otherwise. We are not naturally siding with our multi-billion dollar company, but we do question the intent of Jeremiah O'Keefe at some points. Not on morals, but rather the question of why. 
Why are we going and why are we dedicated to this company? Why are we risking it all to go after this company? This is great writing combined with a fantastic directing of a clear vision. But yes, it does have its flaws when it comes to giving us more substance on the characters or even more screen times. But by the time the credits rolled, it didn't matter because I came to realize that the whole movie felt like I was part of the case and only privileged to a limited amount of information. This was a completely brilliant strategy to really gain a reaction from the climax. When it comes to the chemistry of Jamie Foxx and Tommy Lee Jones, the personalities of these two actors along with the characteristics of these two characters are so polar opposite from each other, but somehow it works to perfection. Between Fox and Jones, they balance each other out and their interactions with each other is powerful, even though at times can feel too brief. This feels like a professional relationship that I wish we had more of, because when we see these two have fun together on screen in moments, I was having fun. When we see the concern or the stress between these two, I was stressed or concerned. I felt the emotion in the dialogue and the performances every time we would be introduced to a new struggle or conflict, no matter how brief. And that's the power in the writing and the dialogue. The delivery and the chemistry between Fox and Jones are absolutely superb here. Seeing these two characters from two walks of life with all different experiences, they find common ground in a natural way that doesn't feel forced. Now, one of my favorite scenes in The Burial is a completely memorable scene where we have Fox who's on a phone call with his wife, where he generally feels bad. He feels bad for disappointing our Jones character. And we generally feel not just for our Fox character, but for both characters because we are invested in the outcome of both of these guys. Now, The Burial defines itself as a comedy drama. This, again, is where the writing is on point. The comedy is never forced or overbearing. The drama never feels overdramatized. The two genres complement each other in just the right way to not distract from the story, which is truly about Willie Gary and Jeremiah O'Keefe. There is a lot I loved about The Burial, and this will be a movie I turn on when I'm having a bad day, where I can see the story of struggle, determination, and going against the odds with characters I truly like and I'm invested in. Now, earlier in my review, I spoke to some flaws with The Burial when it comes to some tonal problems, some substance problems, or even having more time with our characters. When we get into the second half of the movie is where these flaws really come back to haunt the movie. When we get deep into our courtroom scenes, where it can become too safe or too linear. During some of these courtroom scenes, the film doesn't make the emotional stake that the film is really shooting for. And in a couple of the courtroom scenes, some of them do seem too safe and can run a little flat. But you know what? Watching this movie was giving me the emotional reaction and the engagement that this movie demanded. And I can nitpick this movie day and night. I can overanalyze this movie. I can even talk myself out of giving it a four-star review or even the rating I'm about to give it. But usually the first reaction when you see a movie is the right one. This movie gave me all the feels. This movie made me think. This movie made me cheer. But it's like what they say, a good movie will make you think and a great movie will change the way you think and affect you emotionally. The burial did make me think and it did affect me emotionally in all the right ways. Forget about the flaws. I can nitpick it all day long. The burial might not be considered by many to be one of the best movies of the year or even in the same realm. But given where we are this late in the year when it comes to quality, and a lot of these films have just been giving us the same generic fluff, I look at the burial a little differently. When I look at the way this movie made me feel during its runtime all the way to the climax, I ask myself, does it inspire? Yes. Does it engage the viewer? Yes. Does it teach us something? Yes. Does it create an emotional reaction during the entire runtime? Yes. Does it have great performances? Yes! Is it entertaining? A hundred percent yes. And finally, do we care about the outcome of our characters? Absolutely yes. The Burial might not win any awards, but I can care less. This is a movie that will make you feel something big, and given some of the hot topics it hints around, including corruption, racism, poverty, the film does an outstanding job making these topics present without losing the core message. There is no hardened message in The Burial to separate the audience, nor does it get tempted to preach an underlying message. It sticks to the story, vision, and intent, at the same time makes you want to stand on your feet and cheer. This movie is a rare breed of balance, and a movie that will make you get on your feet and cheer these two men on. If there is a movie to stream right now this would be it i'm giving the burial three and a half stars
an ex-special force operative takes a job to provide security for a journalist as she interviews a dictator. But a military coup breaks out in the middle of the interview and they are forced to escape into the jungle where they must survive in the new comedy action film, Freelance. Do you know that feeling when you're doing exactly what you were put on the earth to do? The one where it's like everything inside you is moving together in harmony with the universe. No! Me neither. But, you know, one can hope, right? Wave to mommy, because she'll hate me even more than she already does if you don't. I seem to recall you saying that becoming a lawyer would only crush your soul. Yeah, it has. I'm running a business, and right now that business is getting a journalist and an out of Paldonia. No. It's a one-off. No, no, and no. Who's a journalist? I have resigned my position here. Not interested. 20 grand says you are. Welcome to Paldonia. President Venega, so nice to meet you. We must take a selfie. Um. You approve? Ah, it's great. Ow! What the hell just happened? Your one man's security detail happened. He's a hero. I'm with the president of a country in the middle of a coup. This is the scoop of a lifetime. You gotta be alive to have a scoop for a lifetime. God. We never should have come. Let's go. You can't just leave him. What? Mr. Petit, not Petit at all. John Cena stars in the most vanilla action comedy movie that I have ever seen in my life. Freelance is so safe and it's so bland that it's the type of movie we'll see playing just after watching the Golden Girls in a retirement home to give those over 80 a thrill ride just enough not to hire anybody's blood pressure. And it's a neutral, mild comedy not to offend anybody. It also has just a mild character chemistry like eating a store branded flavor of pudding cup. And for all those elderly ladies wanting to look at some eye candy, we do have John Cena that wears a suit and does have a scene of being shirtless, but only shirtless for a couple minutes. Again, we have to watch the blood pressure. Freelance plays just like a sitcom with an already boring premise, at least for what writer Jacob Lentz is shooting for which is an action comedy. And this is no surprise that he would have trouble with this execution. This is his first full-length film, with his entire writing career being a majority of writing for the Jimmy Kimmel Show. Now, John Cena stars as ex-Special Force operator Mason Petit, who got out of the special ops career to start a family and take a career that he hates. Until ex-ops partner, played by Christian Slater, approaches him to get back in the game for another mission that he describes to be a cakewalk. And this cakewalk of a mission is to protect reporter Claire Wellington, played by Alison Brie, that has had a string of bad luck in her career and is looking to get back on top with an exclusive interview of President Juan Venegas, a dictator in power played by Juan Pablo Raba. Of course, things don't go as planned and the three end up running for their lives in the jungle. Now, there is some great comedic potential here that we just don't have the same old formula of a big muscle man and a damsel in distress in the jungle. Freelance adds a dictator into the mix to run through the jungle with them. And this is where the writing starts to really show how bland and it really is because nothing ever happens. Nothing is suspenseful, nothing funny. We literally have an ex special force agent, a reporter, and a dictator just roaming the woods. It's like the start of a bad joke with no punchline. 
We have some dialogue that's spoken, but it really doesn't go anywhere unless it's to move the story forward. It's so cut and dry and straight to the point, you would have thought that your accountant that enjoys the same ham sandwich and Diet Coke for lunch every single day wrote this film. But to John Cena's credit, you can tell he makes a mild attempt to do something in each scene by adding some body language and his notorious stares. But at the same time, we can't even tell because he looks like he's falling asleep with this material. Now, Freelance is rated R, and this is mainly due to some F-bombs and some action violence and some brief partial nudity. All of these elements were unnecessary for this film and doesn't add any comedic value or any value whatsoever. This wasn't needed in this movie. This is where writer Jacob Lentz attempt to add some lazy flair to his screenplay. This movie could have easily passed for PG, PG-13 if Lentz just dropped these elements. Freelance plays out like it has a tone of a PG family movie. The tone doesn't match the R rating. The whole movie has this tone of a family movie, but with some naughty language and partial nudity. And in no way am I saying take your kids to this because it is rated R for a reason, but my whole point is Lentz doesn't take this film either far enough to justify an R rating, or they should have pulled back to shoot for a more generous rating. I don't think they know exactly what audience they're shooting for. But what I did enjoy about the film is that it does do a decent job keeping the mystery of who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in an almost elementary way, but so elementary I honestly didn't know which way Lent was going to go to take the story. And he does give hints throughout the movie of who we should be rooting for, but then we get a contradiction. So the film does keep us on our toes of playing the movie's guessing game. But at the same time, the characters again are so overly bland, we don't really even care who's good or who's bad. The only thing that keeps this movie mildly engaging is the actual topic of a mystery. And that really is the only thing that keeps us really hanging on to this movie to see if we can guess what the outcome is going to be. The film doesn't really spend a lot of time building these characters to build an interest or engagement. For an action movie, we're not on the edge of our seat hoping our characters will make it through a poorly choreographed action scene. The film treats the audience as we're on a leash forced to go along with them on a walk in the park. There are two scenes that play out in this movie that just prove how generically safe this film is. The first one involves a helicopter crash landing coming right for John Cena. And Cena kind of just speed walks away. And I won't give any more away, but if you watch this film, I would watch where the helicopter's blade lands and tell me you didn't roll your eyes. The next scene is a scene we have seen numerous times in films like this that pulls in some sexual tension between Brie and Cena. And again, I will leave details out, but even this can't be more safe. I would almost question why scenes like this were even put in if there was no follow through. And if there is no follow through, then why can't we be delivered a different direction of our chemistry between Cena and Brie? When making a film like this, it is okay not to have a romantic relationship. Why can't two good-looking people just be friends and call it good? Why not build a relationship on the conflict or the banter? In Rush Hour, we don't see Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker making out. Not everything has to go to the sexual attention route just because there's a male and female in conflict. No, I might be speaking on my own behalf, but if I'm being chased by a militia group, being shot at in the middle of a jungle in the human heat without a shower with animals that want to kill me at every turn, the last thing I would be thinking about is having sex with a stranger that's running with me. If I had all these elements against me, there is no way I'm going to stop, take a break, turn to the stranger next to me and say, hey, it's two o'clock, time for a sex break. Freelance is as generic as they come. It's safe, it's tame, it takes no risk when it comes to its comedy or action, and the cast might as well be cardboard cutouts that the filmmakers just move from one scene to another. The best way I can describe freelance is eating a dry piece of toast and forcing it down with a tall glass of warm tap water from the hose. I'm giving Freelance one and a half stars. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Now, before we get into the rest of the show, make sure you check out my reviews on previous episodes for movies that just became available to rent, buy, or stream now. Now available, Ethan Hunt and his IMF team is back and must track down a dangerous weapon before it falls into the wrong hands. In Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, which was a mission accomplished at three stars. An Indian American teenager has a falling out with her former best friend and inherits a demon that lives in a mason jar. And it lives inside, which had a lot of potential living inside that screenplay, but it barely missed the mark receiving two and a half stars. We have another attempt of telling the story based on the famous Disneyland ride in The Haunted Mansion, which will haunt my dreams and the amount of wasted talent receiving one and a half stars. 
Justice Knows No Boundaries and The Equalizer 3, which shot its way to three stars. The greatest evil in the Conjuring universe is back in The Nun 2, which made me pray for a better movie, receiving two stars. And finally, he's a superhero whether he likes it or not in Blue Beetle, which was stylish, but the rest of the cast was having more fun than our hero. Blue Beetle bugged me enough to only receive two and a half stars. Make sure you check up on those reviews, and while you do, don't forget to hit follow or subscribe, and don't forget to leave me a review on Apple Podcast or Spotify. A composer who suffers writer's block rediscovers his passion after an adventurous one-night stand in She Came to Me. Hey, Doc. Mm -hmm. I was thinking tonight could be a good night for a sex night, possibly. It's an interesting idea, but, you know, Thursdays. Stephen Laudem, how's the new opera coming along? Good, great, yes. great. We had discussed seeing a first draft of the score in two weeks. Two weeks. Is that still all right? I'm suffering from a temporary blockage at the moment. No, turn it back on. One. G flat. Is he all right? He had a total breakdown after his last opera. Uh can't do this. You need to take a walk. Jolt your brain out of its little rat pattern. Interact with a stranger. Okay, honey, I have a patient. Bye. Are we going that way? I keep imagining you naked. I don't know if you want to hear more details about these images. No. I bet every one of these people has a story for an opera in them, Levi. What do you do? I operate a tugboat. The wrong hands, this tug is a deadly weapon. I'm addicted to romance. Isn't everybody? I've been arrested for stalking. I had to go to rehab. And uh, not supposed to be doing this. Can't believe that actually happened. I mean, she seduced me, right? She's a witch. The demented tugboat captain who lures men to her tugboat and kills them and eats them. I loved it. How did you come up with that? I was really angry at you. And now it turns out I'm your muse. Do what? Oh, Steve, I'll never leave you. Um. I love cleaning. Cleaning is as close to godliness. When my patients are talking, I imagine getting inside their heads with disinfectant and just scrubbing them down. Your tugboat captain came to see me. I'm in love. No, no! Just admit that I had a magic effect on you. My imagination came up with the story. My talent wrote the music. I mean, you don't kill men and eat them, do you? <laughs> well, I haven't yet. You know I can't resist a romantic story, even if I'm not in it. Peter Dinklage, Anne Hathaway, Marissa Tomei in a romantic comedy. Can a romantic comedy really go wrong with a cast like this? The answer is yes. Now, before I break it down, let me just say all three of these cast members between Dinklage, Hathaway, and Tomei, their performances are fantastic. There is absolutely nothing wrong here when it comes to our talent. Actually, they are the reason this film is marginally engaging. She Came to Me has an interesting story and an amazing cast, but sadly, the written characters are already bland. And by the time we get to the climax, the character development, we don't really see. The characters don't change much, and they are still, well, bland but the conflict each one is put into crescendos in what the film wants you to believe as an emotional chaos, and I didn't buy it. I didn't believe in this stressful chaos that the writer-director Rebecca Miller presents. This isn't the fault of the cast. The cast performs the written material to the best of their ability, and they do a fantastic job for what it is. The problem is the fact that Miller doesn't have enough substance in our characters to really give them a lift into a believable progression. Our characters are in the center of a conflict, and our situations just circle around the characters and then just drag the audience around with it instead of the other way around. Now, Peter Dinklage plays Stephen, an opera composer that is having a mental block for his next opera. He is married to an OCD psychologist's wife, Patricia, played by Anne Hathaway, and her son, Julian, played by Evan Ellison. Stephen is struggling to find some motivation for his new opera until Patricia kicks him out of the house for the afternoon to help him find some motivation. There, Stephen meets a ship captain, Katrina, played by Marissa Tomei, who then becomes his muse. Now, each character in She Came to Me has their own individual conflict. 
And what Rebecca Miller tries to do is intertwine these conflicts to the point of intersection before the climax. But this just doesn't work. And instead, the conflicts crash and burn when it comes to the point of intersection. Our writer and director Rebecca Miller has a very cut and dry way about her writing, and that also includes her directing. As we've seen from her previous films such as 2017's Maggie's Plan, The Private Lives of Pippa Lee, and The Ballad of Jack and Rose. She tends to focus on a one-sided piece of the relationship conflict and gives no contradiction of curiosity. In this film, for example, in She Came to Me, we look at Stephen and Patricia Trisha's relationship. We get subtle hints of a problematic marriage, but we don't see the why. We don't have this feeling of their marriage is on the rocks. We don't get any in-depth look. The interactions we get between the two is that they seem like a normal married couple with their own flaws, and we still get this vibe that something's wrong, but we don't understand why. They're civil together, they conversate, they seem to know one another, and we don't spend enough time to know their relationship to really judge or determine who they are, because Miller dives right into the first conflict without the audience or the viewer really understanding what the conflict really is. During the runtime of the film, when we spend time with each character and their flaws, every time one of the characters has a conflict, I had to ask myself the question of why. Why do we have marriage problems? Why do we have a writer's block? Why, 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 why? And this rings true with each character and their conflict. She Came to Me truly never resolves these questions, but rather just solves it into a pool of negativity. Every single character is treated with something negative, without any hope or positivity to really have the movie feel engaging. It treats its story as it's just one-sided. It's like when you go out with a group of friends and then you have that one friend that is just negative about everything, no matter how much fun everybody else is having. You're enjoying your day, everything's going your way, then along comes Debbie Downer. Always there to tell you about a new disease, a car accident or killer bees. We beg her to spare you, Debbie, please, but you can't stop Debbie Downer. She Came to Me is truly a Debbie Downer of a movie that even when it attempts to form happiness at the end, it doesn't feel like a happy ending because Miller leaves too many loose ends. We don't get full closure with all of our characters, especially the ones that really needed to have a conflict resolved. Now, the movie describes itself as a comedy drama, and I must have missed something during the runtime because there was maybe one time that I actually chuckled, but I didn't find anything funny about this film or the conflicts, which we could have used in a lot of these scenes to really add some likability or, at bare minimum, a sense of positivity to our situations. The emotional balance from start to finish is way off. It's just one-sided. This movie isn't meant to make you feel good, but rather just makes you depressed and just makes you feel lousy. I can't remember the last time I saw a comedy or a comedy drama that just made me feel lousy walking out of it with no sense of happiness. But in all fairness, when we finally reach the climax, there are little bits of pieces that I actually did like. There's a tad bit of sweetness to it and a little bit of fun that Miller has with it. But this is one of those climaxes that adds a little bit of frustration because the climax reveals what this movie could have been if written and executed properly. Miller had some great ideas and direction in the final act, but by the time the credits rolled, we again had to ask the question of why, and I had to add the question of what. Why did that character make that decision? What happened to so-and-so? And I left the theater not only feeling down and lousy, but also now a little frustrated. She came to me as a cast in a story with so much potential, but it lacks any sort of substance to really like or care about these characters at all. The movie allows the conflicts to work the characters and not the characters working the conflict. The only thing keeping the movie alive is the cast that really try their best to make this film at least entertaining. You take away the brilliant cast and the only thing you're left is a plot to a year-long soap opera. I'm giving She Came to Me two stars. Now, there's a podcast that many of you have listened to me talk about on my show. I have been a great fan of his show, and he has been an amazing supporter of my show. I've talked about this beautiful man's show as being one of the most important podcasts surrounding cinema that you can find right now. I have also had the pleasure of appearing on his show countless times, and every single time it has been an intriguing conversation, along with some agreements and disagreements on a selection of films, including... Slaughter High. And of course, I'm talking about Antonio over the Cult Worthy Cinema Podcast. Now, on his most recent show, Antonio made a very special announcement, and I will do the same. I am not only honored to be part of this project, but I'm also extremely excited to announce that Antonio and I will be teaming up for a brand new show that we are working on right now. 
Like Antonio has said before, he covers the old and I cover the new. And coming at the beginning of this next year, we come together for a show that is truly going to be something special. More details will come. But until then, let's hear from Antonio over at the Cultworthy Cinema Podcast now. The Cultworthy Podcast. Join me, Antonio Palacios, each week as I guide you through a never-ending sea of obscure cinema and cult-worthy gems that deserve a rediscovery. Find me on all listening platforms and at thecultworthy.com. The Cult-Worthy Podcast. Join us. A young fashion designer life spirals as her darkest inner thoughts manifest into something gruesome that won't stop growing in the Hulu original Appendage. At this month's end... I will select a few of you to work on my spring collection. Believe in your own vision. Push through self-doubt. I will not hesitate to let you go. I just want it to be perfect. I know you've been stressed lately, but I'm worried about you, Anne. I'm dealing with it. You can tell me anything. Don't! Did something happen? This is gonna sound crazy. Like, have you ever seen anything like this before? (laughs) No. We have a new guest with us today. You're here because we all have the same problem. Get some form of illness. Like a parasite. Are you okay? Don't touch me. Welcome to the club. Honestly, it was the thing that ever happened to me it's wild but everything she tells you it's true i'll protect you it can't be real she's hiding something down there you can't get rid of me Mm, so delicious You know, I really do look forward to October, especially in the last couple of years where we see a dominant mass release of horror films that have been taking over streaming platforms. Hulu's attempt this October is No One Will Save You and also now Appendage. If you want to take a listen to my review of No One Will Save You, it's on episode 92 of the show. Now we have Hulu's second attempt at the Halloween horror of Appendage. Now, Appendage doesn't really have that Hulu horror feel to it. It drives on subject versus substance or concept versus complexity. It relies heavily on the mere idea to drive its story rather than taking the time to explore the ideas of its main conflict. The story of Appendage follows Hannah, played by Hadley Robinson from last year's Netflix original The Pale Blue Eye. Hannah is in a new relationship with Kaylin, played by Brandon McChild Smith, who is under a lot of pressure at work as a fashion designer. Working for an over-demanding designer, boss Christian, played by Desmond Borges, where she has to meet a deadline to get her ideas into the spring collection for Christian. The continuous stress builds until one day she grows and outputs an appendage that opens up a curious past in her thoughts and built up anger and aggression in the form of a creature. Now, there's a lot of layers to appendage and a lot more of in-your-face symbolic messaging that is a lot more simplistic than what we got from No One Will Save You. The differences that we have is that appendage knows how to land the messaging in a more simplistic way without trying to be something that it's not. Even when we get a first glimpse at our simplistic and fake-looking creature, at the first sight of the ridiculous look of it, we want to smile and laugh out of the pure cheapness of it. But there is a certain unease that the director and writer Anna Zalakovich creates that turns our laugh into an awkward chuckle, where we have this lingering feeling of a vision of something that's to come from our writer and director. This is Anna Zalakovich's first big writing credit, and I have to say there is a lot of potential here when it comes to her directing style. There is an edginess she puts into her lighting and shots that even with a cheap-looking creature, she really adds a sense of unease and curiosity of what's to come. 
She knows how to build a story with her proper vision, but where the problem lies is with the writing, where the film does take a while to get going with the build of it all, which is all fine and dandy because the first half of the film, we get a really nice balance between work stress relationship and creature conflict. But when we get into the second half of the film, we focus too much on the creature and Hannah's relationship to the creature that it doesn't go all in on the chaotic field to support the messaging of our creature's symbolic nature of built up emotion. Zolokovic loses that chaotic stress and just deep dives into the focus of the creature background and a separate subplot that plays out like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And this is where I'm torn because Appendage has a twist that I didn't see coming, but yet I have a problem with ignoring some of the sub-conflicts that originally led to this symbolic creature, such as more screen time with each and every character that led to some of these stresses, especially with designer Christian that each scene with Hannah at work with Christian was extremely likable and it was tense in its own unique way, and I wanted more of that to really support the emotional build of Hannah. The other flaws are moments that really doesn't make sense and it kind of throws the movie off when it comes to feel, where it really doesn't make sense or it feels out of place like it was meant to be cut out. For example, we have awkward conversations with Hannah and her mother on the phone about a dinner party that seems way out of place too brief and it made no sense when it comes to the conversation. It needed way more background and build to really convince the viewer. It just felt out of place to the point if you took it out, nobody would notice. A lot of these conversations inserted by Zolokovic that seemed like they're just being thrown in to convince the audience of a symbolic message of the apparition or to try and over-validate the reason why we have the apparition. Or Zolokovic thought that she wasn't clear enough of what the apparition was and she's throwing in random additional things after the script was originally written to give and justify the reason why to ensure the messages landed. And with all these moments of these conversations that really don't make sense, this is where the movie starts to tumble downhill when it comes to its conversational build and it tries to go more on over explaining the motivation of the apparition. This is where the second half of the movie starts to have trouble balancing messaging versus just being a creature feature. We have this balance build in the first half of the movie where it feels like Zolokovic is really going to build something, and yet she does when it comes to twist, but when it comes to substance to support the twist, this is where the film really falls flat. But I have to say, I actually did kind of enjoy this movie. Is Appendage scary? Not so much as it is unsettling, because what Zolokovic does right is doing a fantastic job at creating relatability on mental stress of trust, work stress, and the stress of thinking and thinking of past mistakes, and giving a visual of the output of the toxicity of the result. But to its credit, even though not scary, Zolokovic creates an entire runtime of just pure unsettlement. Even with the writing flaws, the emotion and lack of its passion in creating a message is present. We have the first and second half of Unpalance when it comes to how it portrays a message, but the message is still landed regardless. I found the appendage to be a stepping stone or a seed of a blueprint for how not to overcomplicate a horror movie if the filmmaker is trying to portray a message. But Zolokovic needs to either take the unsettlement to the next level in her writing or find a proper balance in terms of amplifying our symbolic conflict. Appendage won't give you the chills nor scare you, but rather shows us something that will take us on a self-reflection of how we deal with our past and current expectations, which for most of us will be a different kind of scare or unsettlement. Appendage is low budget, it's engaging, it has a nice twist to boomerang the audience into a curiosity of thinking what's next. Even with all of its flaws, I actually did kind of like the appendage, so I have to give it a very marginal recommendation at three stars. And that's a cut on this week's edition of the Movie Wire. I want to thank you for listening and thank you for your support. You can also show support by following me on Instagram, Blue Sky X, Thread, Facebook, TikTok, and Letterbox at Movie Wire Show. And don't forget to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Until next week, do me a favor. Make sure you stay for after the credits to show the respect to those that put their blood, sweat, and tears into making a feature film and support your local movie theaters. Verdict has been made on this episode of The Movie Wire by your host, Justin Hansen. He thanks you for listening to the show. You can follow Justin on Instagram and Twitter at Movie Wire Show or visit his website, www.themoviewire.com. Oh, and don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. 
Until next time, we will see you at the movies. Thank you for bringing me to the movies.